Hi, I'm Adam Zand. I'm president of the Library Land Project. And I'm Greg Peverell-Conti, the executive director of the project. And both of us are here today to welcome you to Library Land Conversations. This is our opportunity to highlight and learn from smart, dedicated people in the library ecosystem. And these conversations are, have really been a way for us to explore and, and in some ways remember what we love about public libraries because we haven't been able to visit them as much as we used to. And uh, we miss those chats with library workers and folks who play an important role in the function of libraries, or even the patron experience when visiting a new library. So sharing those stories and interests and uh, experiences is the aim of library link conversations. I'm gonna move over to today's uh, discussion and we're joined by a fellow library traveler uh, Tim Tippett is Associate Director of the Graduate Center, Graduate Career Center, DeBorn McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. Hello, Tim. Hello, Adam. Hello, Greg. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Good. Well, I'm, I'm going to continue that introduction, and uh, I'm just going to mention how we met. Uh, it was a while ago, several years ago. Um, I was assisting the MBA school, uh, my MBA school by interviewing international MBA students as they prep for their corporate residency programs. Uh, recently, Greg and I have been thinking about expanding our team with an intern and lo and behold, a meeting with Tim happened. So after that introduction, rather lengthy, we're gonna move on to what we love as patrons and library tourists. Tim will even share an origin story about how he met his future wife in a library and as mentioned, we've been thinking a lot about the patron experience and what makes libraries special. So this episode is hopefully timely. So over to you, Greg. Thanks, Adam. So Tim, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, when we spoke a couple of days ago and discovered like your incredible passion for libraries, we were just so thrilled. I mean, we want everyone to love libraries as much as, as you do. Um, but you, you talked about a specific library that is near and dear to, to all of us on this on this uh, interview, the Newton Free, and wondered if you would share uh, a little of the story that about what makes the Newton Free Library a special library for you. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and it was so great to connect with you guys because I felt like I found my my library tribe, as I called it the other day, which is a pretty unique breed of cat. But uh, the Newton Free Library has been very uh, important to me. I've lived in the town for almost 30 years. I remember the previous library. And I actually, um, before it was common, the work from home thing, I, I've worked from home off and on my entire career. So I would often go over to the Newton Free Library as, as, a, as a place to work. I would reserve a conference room. It was just a change of scenery. It was a place that had air conditioning, which my home still does not have. And it just meant so much to me as a place to work, but also a place to leverage the wonderful programming that they uh, for a long time have had in person and done their very best to port over the web as, a, as an option. So the community programming, just the space itself, I still think of it as the new library, which is not new, it's 20 years old, I think now, but uh, it's a great spot. Um, one of the things that really fascinated us when we spoke to you was uh, your travels around the USA. I mean, we envy you to have been to, I think you said 48 states. You know, what, what has that been like? So it's, it's been great fun. The origin of that is my son is a big baseball fan. I never really was. So our goal is to get to all 30 of the ballparks, which we were supposed to complete last year. We've been working on it for a, a dozen or so years. So we've got just a, a West Coast swing to hit a couple of ballparks. Um, and I've since fallen in love with baseball now that we've done this for over a decade, my son and I. So we do a road trip every summer. And both my kids could tell you, um, as well as doing cross-country trips, I always insist on hitting up the local libraries. So we've been to all the states, with the exception of the, the you know the two of the Dakotas. Um, and we don't always hit up a library in every place, but we, we try to and uh, have had a lot of fun and just see how they, they differ and vary across the country, both in architecture and services offered. Uh, that's, uh, that's awesome. I mean, obviously, we... we... The, like Greg said, meeting up with a fellow library traveler is always a treat. 
Uh, can you take your mind back to some of those early experiences? So you're, you're on the road and you had to do what? Like, why, why did you choose a library basically to visit? So I've just always loved libraries. I, I think a lot like Greg, you know, it started with the love of learning. And um, I can, re to my mother's credit, you know, we were young kids in elementary and middle school. She'd make sure that we were plugged into our local library. I grew up in a very small town called Hamden, Massachusetts, which is near Wilbraham outside of Springfield and had a very modest but lovely library on the second floor of the public building downstairs was, you know, police and fire. And, um, you know, at the time, I'm sure I hated having to read 10 books every summer and get my little book reading certificate, but I look back at it fondly. So that turned into falling in love with libraries again as a college student. So I just love the quiet space. And I, I, I don't know a lot about architecture, but I'm, I'm a, a great uh, observer of kind of the obvious. So I love some of the beautiful architectural designs. So as we go into different cities, um, you know, I would often make a point to, you know, we'd always have time before the ball game a day or two sometimes to kill time. So we would, I would try to fit in a library whenever I could to my, uh, often dismay of my children, but I think now they're just used to it. You know, uh, a lot of our, a lot of our work is focused on understanding the patient perspective. I mean, we came to the library land project and originally as, as sort of super patrons who are trying to, to see and understand and learn. Um, are there specific things as a patient that you look for that strike you when you, when you visit a library for the first time? Um, I mean, do you use libraries to try to get a sense of the community you're visiting? What's that experience like? All the time. So my first stop in any library is to look at their local board. You know, they'll often have community announcements or they might be promoting a local artist. I mean, that's before I even sit down. You know, that's walking in through the main lobby. And I get a feel for the town that way. And I always use it as a way to kind of take a look at the local newspaper and get a better sense of the community and look at the programming. But yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely get that, that feel from place to place. It's, it's, do you want to share a couple of those highlights? You know, sure. some of those travels, state, yes. city, whatever. Yeah. So I can remember being on vacation in Cape Cod and falling in love with the Chatham public uh, library there for the architecture and just thought the quaintness of it and just to get a better sense. I, I was so curious to see how the actual locals lived, unlike the tourists like myself that would visit for just a week at a time. And it was really cool to kind of get a sense of that local color, if you will, um, of, of uh, the folks that, that live there and, and often grew up there. So that was one place that really, really resonates. But, you know, a little bit closer to home in South Natick, the Bacon Library, which is a tiny, beautiful building. You know, when I'm feeling housebound as we all have been so much with COVID and I kind of think, boy, what would I love to do? If, if you know, given the opportunity, it would be to, you know, grab a great cup of coffee at the Charles River Coffee Shop across the street from, you know, the Bacon Library and just kind of poke around their stacks or, you know, read about some of their local programming. So that's another one that's, that's close to home that I, I, I think- It's a really nice little library. Yeah, it's really quaint and really cool. That's, how, how about anything on a on a baseball travel, you know, for farther afield? Yeah, anything so, come you, know, to mind? you know, I can remember when we went into New York to see the Yankees and um, the Mets play, and I would, you know, it's Manhattan, it's right, it's the center of the universe. I would, again, much to my kids' dismay, would make a beeline for the New York Public Library at Bryant Park and would hope for it to rain so I would have an excuse to be in there for like the entire afternoon, you know, and just poking through the stacks, looking at newspapers from all over the world, but that's one in New York City that I just will visit there every time I, uh, you know, where most people make a beeline for maybe Broadway, you know, I make a beeline for the library. You know, no, my, my New York Public Library card's expired. I need to, I need to go back down and renew it. But that library at Bryant Park is just a magical place in my opinion. Yeah, it was one of our early ones as we were sort of combining our, our PR work with our love of libraries. So yeah, kind of special for us as well. Uh, they, they, they don't have baseball necessarily, but Brooklyn has some uh, fascinating libraries too. I don't know if you get over to any of the boroughs. I, I do from time to time, but not recently, but I've done it with different colleges. So, you know, if you can get in at, you know, like Wellesley College or, or Harvard close to home or on the campus of Harvard Business School and going into the business school library and going into the basement and seeing, you know, one of the original trading desks from Wall Street, you know, an actual living piece of history that you can see, touch and feel. I mean, I just, I love all that. And by the way, they also carry books, I'm told as well, you know. 
Um, you mentioned baseball have, uh, it's not, it's sort of by appointment, but have you ever tr uh, thought about doing the library at Cooperstown? Like the, in the hall of fame, not like. Yeah, the I've been to the hall of fame two or three times, but I've never, you know, that, that itself was always the destination. So we never had enough time to do anything, but that's a good idea. I hadn't thought to do the, the I would love to see the library there. You know, another library baseball connection, when Adam and I visited the Library of Congress uh, a year and a half, two years ago, they had a, an incredible baseball exhibit. It was a, it was a really nice part of the collection that they had uh, circulated out for for people to see. It's it's really nice to see that kind of thing. Yeah, and that was on my bucket list. I, I don't get to DC that often, but when I do, I'd love to go to the Library of Congress. That would be amazing to see. It it, it definitely is. So I, I've got a bigger uh, picture question for you, and really back to your day job in some ways. Do you see merit in library professionals having business degrees or at least, you know, having experience in business classes? I do. I think, you know, the library science piece is super critical, but to maybe augment it with some electives around business classes would make real good sense because I'm sure, uh, you know, even though they're funded publicly in different ways, it, they are businesses. So to learn how to bring in revenue streams, but also some of the softer skill stuff, learning how to partner with the community, you know, the public relations and the marketing aspects, I think are all really critical, as is the customer service piece, which I think the Newton Library has done well. You know, they have a nice relationship with the community. You know, they used to have a, a you know, the, you know, a suggestion box that you could tell was read and they would public a, publish answers and, you know, would, would take, you know, but that kind of, kind of customer service to the next level. And, and, and that's the sort of thing, you know, that's taught in business programs that just maybe isn't, inherent to someone that that maybe was never exposed to that aspect of business before let me flip that question do you think it would make sense for folks pursuing their business degree to also be studying some information science to help them understand the way to think about organize authenticate produce consume information yeah it's, it, that's a very good idea it would be very very helpful and also how to you know we've had great re resources at northeastern university in our own library um for business students to connect with with the team and the staff there to learn how to effectively research and cite articles and that sort of thing too. So yeah, there's a whole process around it that's mutually beneficial. Cool. Um, thinking about universities, you know, and public spaces in general, uh, you know, what kind of changes do you see or expect to see as we come out of the pandemic, both you know libraries and and, and universities? Yeah. So I would say that. Um, Specific to libraries, I think people are going to welcome going back there, but I'd love to see them turn more into, I think of like kind of the Vermont General Store, uh, the Vermont General Store with kind of the wood stove in the lobby and its gathering place. I'd love to see more of that kind of um, central focal point, especially in some of these smaller, more charming towns that I've seen, you know, in the Midwest or here in New England, certainly, and, and have a more program based. I'd love to see some additional offerings uh, to bring in business people or utilize their conference rooms. Or we had spoken the other day, or, you know, you had mentioned Greg, uh, you and Adam had mentioned, you know, maybe makerspace, you know, that sort of thing to bring in the community more, but have it be more of a central hub of the community uh, and gathering place where I, I kind of assimilate with that, you know, with the concept of the general store in Vermont, for example. So I see that as a possibility. Uh, I think it's going to have much more need requirements as people are doing more and more work from home. Because I do believe that as much as they love working off their kitchen table, as do I, it's nice to get out and be around other humans, right? So that's an application as well. And I think we're going to see that more with the university. So with our university, we've dedicated space to open cafe space, open Wi-Fi for the neighborhood. So we're trying to be a better community partner that way. And I think we'll see more public use space being cordoned off at some of these larger universities, certainly. Uh, it, 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 as a way to not only promote the university, but I would argue more importantly to be a better neighbor in the neighborhood to, you know, where we're located with some of the, uh, you know, there's a, a wide range of abilities and incomes in the area. So, you know, people that maybe don't have or can't afford the best Wi-Fi, they can come into some of our public spaces and use that. And I think that helps us be a better, a better neighbor in the city of Boston. Does that answer the question? Does that help at all? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're just, we're interested in hearing how people see those changes happening. And I, you know, it's encouraging to hear how public institutions can maybe become more integrated into their communities, whether that's a university or, or, 
for public libraries. And you know, truly, in speaking to other people, that seems to be a, a common theme that we're hearing more and more of, that, that community institutional uh, integration. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Well, the, the, the clock's winding down a little bit on this conversation, Tim. We, we really appreciate your time. And um, I, I, we can't leave without you sharing how you met your wife. Yeah, it's really unique. And uh, it, it all had it happened in the library. So we both went, you know, we grew up in Western Massachusetts. So we went to kind of a, a nice, small, private school. Not a lot of people have heard of it, but it worked for us called Western New England University, which is primarily known for three things. Good, good little business school great engineering and a very good law school. So for our area, that was a great spot to go. So I never knew my wife in college. It was literally uh, her last final. I'm not exaggerating. The last time she stepped foot on campus. Now we'll have to go back in the time machine. This is like May, 1984. And we've been together ever since. So, and I'm going to date myself, but you guys will remember, you know, they're called carols, right? In libraries, you sit in a carol. It's kind of a little mini cubicle and it's two feet high, you can't see the person in the cube, in the Carol. So Car and coincidentally, my wife's name is also Carol. So my, my, my wife-to-be, Carol, was sitting on kind of couches with a friend. I walked in, I was in a Carol, she could not see me, and I sneezed. And she said, God bless you, Timmy. And of course, I had such a big ego then, I thought, oh, she must know who I am. Now, it's a small enough school where I would recognize her and I knew she had a friend of a friend, but we definitely didn't know each other. I mean, I, she lived there, I was a commuter student. And she was literally studying for her last final to take the next day to never return to campus again. But it was that was the icebreaker. So um, I used that as an excuse to go over and start to kind of talk to her, or as the kids would say, chat her up, right? So, and, and as it turned out, she was actually referring to a different friend, coincidentally, in that same Carol pod of four Carols, who was also named Timmy, uh, a different <laughs> wow. person. So that wow. was really what her friend. Chances? So this was all total coincidence. I'm arrogant. Super salt, you know, competent at the time. Who wasn't it? You know, the ripe old age of 20, 22 years old and 100 pounds ago, right? So I thought she was talking to me. So that gave me the confidence to go over and speak with her. And we had a nice little chat. We kind of, you know, where are you from? Where I'm from. And then fast forward, that was May. Fast forward to July, right? She's long since done with school. I'm working my summer job. Um, I receive a piece of mail at home addressed to me. And it's her writing to me saying, hey, you mentioned, you know, if, you go, you enjoy Tanglewood. If you're ever in the Berkshires, it was a beautiful letter, you know, come and see me. Here's my phone number. And so I called her the next day and, you know, 30 years later, we're still married, but to close that out, and this is the real ironic part. And it has to do with the library, I promise. So back then we're so old, right? This is free internet, 1984, 85. You would, she didn't have my home address. You could look it up on the internet. So she went to the Pittsfield public library where she's from, where you used to go and you could access phone books. Remember phone books guys? And for my town, because she remembered Hamden, she pulled out the local Hamden phone book. And my last name is Tippett. It's not real common, but in a small town of about 5,000 people, there were two families with the last name Tippett. One was listed as Tom Tippett and the other one was Zachary or something like that. So my, this true story, my wife guessed, she said, I bet Tom would name his son Tim. And that's the address she wrote to. I kid you not, I have chills, true story. And I got that beautiful letter and of course called her the next day saw her probably the following weekend and we've been together ever since that's a true story so it involved two libraries so there you have it love by library that is an amazing story a beautiful story i mean you know it's also speaks to i mean her, her clear interest in connecting with you since they meant a trip to the library to look right. up uh, that's that's such a wonderful story um thank you you're welcome. I'm glad you could appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I don't tell it to many people, but well, um, lovers of libraries especially uh, get it. So, and we're still together, which is uh, not an easy accomplishment 30 years later. So it's been very cool for us. Well, I thank you for, for being willing to share that with us. I, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Tim Tippett. Uh, you've been listening to him. Once again, he's Associate Director of the Graduate Career Center at DeMore McKim School of Business at Northeast University. And one more time, go Huskies, especially women hockey team, which continues to blow me away this season. So uh, I, I, I guess just one thing for our audience, uh, thank you for watching. And in the future, um, we're gonna keep on sharing these. So if you have ideas about people you'd like to hear from, 
or uh, thoughts about the show, please drop us an email, uh, info at librarylandproject.org. And uh, obviously you could comment uh, when we post these on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube and all those sorts of platforms. So once again, thank you, Tim. Thank you guys. It was a lot of fun. Great to be here. Thanks very much. Really?